Hey everyone, and welcome to Bright and Early, the podcast for people building early stage startups. I'm your host, Brian Ray. I talk to entrepreneurs, product people, designers, and marketing pros to learn what works, what doesn't, to figure out how we can apply those lessons to our business. My guest today is Ben Ornstein. Ben is the co-founder of Tuple, a remote pair programming tool for developers. He's also the co-host of the Art of Product podcast. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. It's great to great to have you. We were just talking offline. I've I've been hearing your voice for a little while, um, listening to uh, Art of Product and you know the other things that you've been up to. So it's kind of funny to have you. It's it's fun to have you on the show and uh, to get to talk to you in person. Totally, yeah. I'm psyched. I've I've been listening to you as well. So oh, it'll be good. like two people who sort of know each other, but indirectly, <laughs> actually connecting for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm really curious to hear about kind of the yeah just the 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 steps that the process that you've gone through to get tuple to where it is now um it's been fascinating that you've been building it you know in public but but privately um because it's been uh, private access so i'm excited to hear all of that but let's let's start with just the concept of pair program pair programming most listeners are probably familiar with the concept but just for everyone's benefit to, to get on the same page can you give us like the one two minute explanation of what pair programming is and why it's integral to some developers workflow totally um pair programming is kind of just a fancy name for writing code together yeah uh, so it's basically just two developers that are working on a problem side by side and maybe that means literally sitting next to each other and like using one computer or uh, using an app like ours or something else, uh, possibly doing it remotely where someone kind of joins you on your computer and is sort of looking over your shoulder virtually as you're writing code together. Yes. Okay. And the reason that you might do this is that, um, well, one, programming is hard. It's easy to do it wrong or yeah. write bugs. Um, it's easy to get distracted. Uh, and just if you just think about human learning, We've been basically doing this forever, which is like two people collaborating on a problem mm -hmm. often leads to better results than one person doing it by themselves. So this is just kind of a word for it when you're doing it with code. And it's really nothing, there's, there's not that much to it that's special. It's just kind of this old thing that we've always been doing, which is more or less just combining brains and trying to create a better result. Okay. And so in Tuple specifically, it's a, it's a tool that, each programmer will have on their machine and mm -hmm. how does it work exactly? Uh, you can kind of just think of it like screen sharing plus remote control. So if I was like, Hey Brian, can you help me out with this code? Uh, you know, this area of the app better than I do. Um, I would love to get a second set of eyes on this. Uh, you would connect to my computer using our app and then you would see my screen and we'd be able, we'd be able to talk and there'd be audio. And then if at some point you were like, actually I was thinking maybe we should do it sort of like this you would be able to actually take over control of the mouse and keyboard and use my computer as if you were sitting right there with the controls in your hands. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to play devil's advocate then, some mm -hmm. people might hear your description of, of Tuple Ben and say, uh, you, you mean like screen sharing on a Zoom call? Mm -hmm. um, why are so you, you're building, you and your co-founders are building a product for something that already exists. Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. <laughs> um, because our theory is that little details matter. So Zoom actually is a, is a good app. I think Zoom is pretty solid. When it comes to what we're doing now, like uh, where we're focused on each other's faces and we're talking and we're doing a video call, Zoom is great. Mm -hmm. um, Zoom technically does have a remote control mode, but it is not their focus. It is tucked away in a certain place. Only certain plans have access to it. If you wanted to give me control, you'd have to manually hand it off to me. Um, it's just a little bit clunkier because it's not dedicated towards this use case. And so our active theory is that if we care about pair programming specifically more than anybody else, we can make a tool that will be nicer enough to use over these existing solutions that people will prefer it. And so yeah. far that seems to be the case. Uh, we, we, we sign up a lot of customers who previously used things like Zoom or the old Slack calls or Screen Hero back in the day uh, that find um, the overall user experience of how we do things to be better, better yeah. enough that it's worth switching. Yeah. How much of that, uh, how much of that did, you, did you test before you started writing 
code on tuple that that hypothesis there of um yeah we we get it you can do this we can do this elsewhere but the latency mm-hmm. is is uh, it, it gets in your way mm-hmm. we think that we can do it specifically very very good how much of that did you test with people versus how much of it did you say i think this is true because i'm a very experienced developer and i have seen people paying for this well um sort of a mixed answer so to some extent we kind of just went for it so i have two co-founders and all of us had quit our jobs and started working on the app before Mm -hmm. we had proved that this would work so we kind of just jumped in as soon as we started writing code i was out there trying to sell this so um, my other two co-founders joel and spencer were writing code and working on on what would become the product but i was out actually trying to get people to buy it so we were kind of doing de-risking very early and just making sure like, okay, if I describe an app uh, that sounds a certain way, will people get excited and will they pay us for it? And then the final piece of that is really the, the genesis of Tuple was that there was this wonderful app for doing this called Screen Hero. Yeah. And it got bought by Slack and shut down. And so there was just this gap in the market in our minds. And it was like, well, it seemed like, I mean, I was a Screen Hero user and I liked it and I thought it was great but nothing quite as slick as it exists anymore. And so um, that seemed like further validation. And it had been four years or so, but it seemed like, okay, there was this thing that people knew and loved and used, and now it's gone. It seems pretty likely that if we made something, if we can make something that yeah. is uh, a similar level of quality, we'll be able to, to capture some of those people. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you specific step-by-steps of you going out and selling it um, before, before I want to, ask about that specifically but i do want to jump into what you were just talking about and uh and read a little bit of marketing copy from your landing page i think it is it is so readable and connects with what you were just saying um and it's i'd love to hear the process that you went through to arrive here so uh it says after Screen Hero was acquired, we were sure someone would come along to make a tool specifically for pair programming. Sure, you could technically get some pairing done with something like Zoom, but it was clearly built for business types, not programmers who hate undismissable UI Chrome. And Slack calls is fine, but not having remote control is rough. Have you ever tried to dictate some code for your pair to write? Another problem, if you're going to type on a remote machine, the connection has to be low latency. This is the sort of thing that generic screen sharing tools just don't care much about. That feels like, that does not sound like website copy. That (laughs) sounds like you are talking to me about your thing. So can you just talk about the process there um, of of coming to those? Like uh, I noticed like some context setting. Remember Screen Hero? Like that was Mm -hmm. great. Uh, Mm -hmm. Zoom, it's there, but it's too much. Slack, it's fine, but you don't have this required thing. What what was it like for you guys to to come to that? summary of 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 tuples uh, positioning um i mean i i so the this that copy that actually started its life on our original landing page okay. which was like okay we need to put a, a, a stake in the ground and say hey we're doing a thing mm-hmm. and uh, my co-founder spencer sort of spun up a template and he wrote this headline that ended up being the headline that stayed on there for a long time that i loved which is Remember when Slack stole Screen Hero from us? Oh man, that's so good. And I was just like, <laughs> wow, that is perfect. Yeah. And that that prompt yeah. basically c- caused the rest of the copy. It was like, remember the big bad thing that happened to the good thing? Well, we want yeah. the good thing again. Yeah. And here's why what's out there is not good enough. Mm-hmm. And and I, we that that acknowledgement of there are other options, you know about them, I think makes sense. Yes. Um, um, a thing I learned from my friend Matt Wensing was he said uh, a sales thing, which is like if you're worried about people's objection to a uh, to something, just talk about it and like sort of flip it on its head. Yeah. Or like if like another way of saying this is like um, if there's an elephant in the room, introduce it. It's like we know you've heard of Zoom. We know that Zoom has some remote control capabilities. Yeah. So if that's the first thing you think, I have to address that objection early on. Yep. Yep. Um, we didn't invent this, you know, space of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd rather talk about, yes, we know that's there, but you, you're probably frustrated. If you're a good customer for us, you're frustrated by it in these ways. Like we talk about undismissable UI Chrome. Most people don't care about that, but uh, like as yeah. a certain uh, P 
picky and a retentive developer, undismissible UI Chrome drives me crazy. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. So it's like, and, and so, I mean, they're they're reading that and they're like, they are hearing you call it UI Chrome. Like, oh, this mm. per, this person gets me. Totally. That is how. It, yeah. 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 I, I wanted it to. I wanted this, the whole thing, like the the page and the app and everything, to just basically to speak to pro- the right type of programmers yes. and not really be appealing to anybody else. Mm-hmm. I, I, like it's like this page is kind of full of proof and shibboleths that like we are programmers too and we're frustrated and care about the same things that you care about. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, cause the three of the three of you quit your, quit your jobs to go in on this. Um, it, and it, it definitely sounds like and looks like you, you guys did the, a really good job of doing what a lot of people struggle with early on, which is, no, we are going to be very, very focused on a very particular customer. Um, what I, a lot of people struggle with that because they think, oh, gosh, I mean, we, we're, we're early. We, we, we got to get some money in the, in the door here. So we're not going to say no to anybody. Mm. Um, was, there, was there any struggle with that at all? Or was it? Like, no, y'all, the, if, if this is going to stick, we've got to be specific. Um, def, I mean, yeah, I think it was mostly the latter. Yeah. Like if, yeah. if the core, that said, like, so, so my theory, our theory was like, there are enough people that, that care about these things that we can just focus on them. And by the way, if we make a really great re- uh, remote pairing app that programmers love, you know, maybe someday that becomes a really great app that other people that are not as technical love too. Like if you, if you satisfy the most discerning customers, you yeah. can later potentially change your positioning to take on more. Yeah. No immediate plans for that. Uh, we're pretty happy okay. where we are and we don't think yeah. we've even come close to like maxing out this niche. Okay. Um, and we might never ever move from there, but it was like, well, if we just make it, if we focus on the, the people that are really picky, it's probably not a bad place to start. Yeah. Did you also, did you find it to be true um, that by being so specific and so targeted that you're, you had a bit more upper range in your in your pricing. Did that play into it at all? Um, uh, maybe. It, I mean, I have to imagine the positioning effect of the pricing. And like people, when they push back on our prices now, it's it's it sort of like feels like that there's a congruency there where it, like people will say, the people that push back on our price say, your price is reasonable, but I don't pair often enough to justify it. But I think okay. the world does need a tool like this. So it, it kind of feels like the, the positioning is more or less working. They're like, okay, you are the pairing tool. If I don't want to use a generic tool, um, I can choose you instead and it's better. Do I pair enough to feel like that's worth the cost? Mm. Are most of your customers right now, um, do, do they pair over 50% of the time or are they like purely a pairing team or what, what, what are you seeing there? Um, I actually don't know the breakdown. This is something I do want to check. Like what, what is the average usage? Um, mm-hmm. But I do, I am aware of like the high end of usage. Like when we sort by like who's using it the most, some of our teams are using it like all day, every day. Yeah. Like there are some cultures that believe that you should pair on most things. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a fairly extreme point of view. It's not crazy, uh, but it's not that common. But we, we do see that at the high end, like there's just like just crazy constant usage. Right. My guess is the average team um, does more of the average thing, which is you pair on things occasionally. Like sometimes you want to just work by yourself. It's, it's actually a lot more draining to pair with someone just because you, you have this sort of full-time social context that's happening as well. And yeah. this communication is taking place. Yeah. Um, and so you tend to, you probably tend to write better code and have fewer bugs when someone else is helping you with it, but it's, it's harder actually. It's, it's way more draining. So yeah. most people choose to opt into it a little bit less frequently than that. Okay, cool. Um, are, you, are you trying to um define a specific target market in terms of remote first startups or b2b saas orgs larger than uh, 50 employees i don't know pick, pick something are you are you targeting that right now or did you target it early on not really um we wanted to make sure in, in the beginning we were more restrictive about who we let use the app because we wanted to make sure that the feedback that we were getting in the early days was from people we thought would be good customers. Um, and so uh, we used to be a little bit more stringent or like we used to block people at all, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were looking for people that paired a lot and cared about pairing and cared about the kind of UX details that we were talking about. 
where like we our, our sort of idea was resonating with them. Yeah. Uh, now we our signups are basically open, and so okay. it's like okay, if you want to give it a shot, you can give it a shot and see if it sticks. Okay. We're, we're sort of okay with that now. Yeah, man, that is that is such a good uh, thing to to take away. Is you were uh, you were pretty stringent early on to make sure that the feedback that you received is coming from the right people. Um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to getting feedback from anybody like, well, yeah, you, you're saying that you want this to be a little bit different. You're not our, you're not our customer. Um, how, was that just kind of an an organic discussion among you and and your co-founders of, okay, yeah, this sounds like a valid criticism, but it's not coming from a, it's not coming from a good customer or how, how do how do you kind of parse that out? Um, I don't remember an explicit discussion quite like quite of that nature. I mean, now we, we still get feedback from people that want to take, like kind of want us to take the product in different directions. Mm-hmm. So we've intentionally sort of chosen a fairly limited use case or a very particular use case. Mm-hmm. Um, people like the app and want to use it for more things, which is awesome. But sometimes they'll ask us for things that are like support a use case that we're not really interested in getting into right now. Okay. Uh, is there an example? Ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, um, pairing is typically between one, like two people and people kept asking us, I want to invite more people. I want to invite more people. Huh. Uh, and so like, okay, we're going to let you invite a third person. And now everyone's like, I want to invite a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And we're like, why? And it's like, Oh, we want to do, uh, we want to use this for standups. And it's like, okay. Yeah. Like, okay. Or, um, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's very flattering. <laughs> Um, but like, that's not where we want to go right now. Okay. So one, one cool thing that, uh, that I think is, uh, you, you mentioned this, there's like a, four, there's a four minute, you know, screencast at tuple.app and you point out that there's a way for the developer to pull up, you know, like to, to look at bandwidth and CPU usage, you know, in your screen sharing app. Um, that's, that is something that would only appeal to develop or, to, to technically oriented folks who are like, hey, something's janky here. I'm not just going to like spin off a support request to Tuple. Hey, something is slow. You're going to say, oh, I need to close a couple of different apps or, or that sort of thing. And so is the, the concept of being able to add three, four, or five people, would it inherently slow those things down and make Tuple look worse? Or why, why are you concerned about being able to add a third, fourth, and fifth person? Uh, well, the answer is is pretty deeply technical. Um, but the, the gist is, <laughs> if you and I set up a connection between us, the data is only flowing between two people. Yes. And okay. it, as we add a third person, now it's flowing between me and you and that third person and that third person and you. Yes. And so there's actually like this, like this exponential increase as you add people. Yeah. And so when you get to like four, you actually do something different, which is you don't create like a peer-to-peer mesh network like that. You there's like other techniques for this, but it's kind of like a big architectural difference between how we're doing it now and what we would need okay. to do to support that. Okay. And that, by the way, is what Zoom is really good at. Like you can be on a Zoom call with a hundred people and Zoom, like that is their bread and butter use case. And like their value proposition is that will actually work. It's really hard. And so like, <laughs> we don't want to take on that kind of thing. It's not our core thing. Yeah. So we, we stay away from it. Yeah. So- solving that problem is an, is a, is an entire company. That is what Zoom is doing. Absolutely, yeah, a public that. company cool. worth billions of okay. dollars. What? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What's the, um, how, how do you describe that back to your customers who are requesting the, uh, who are requesting that feature then? You say, like no, that. not right now, or no, and um, why? Like, what advice do you have for people when they, to, what advice do you have for people in your position needing to tell customers no? Um, so one thing that I think is one advantage of like selling to people like us is that we can be technical with them. And so we can explain to them the technical limitations and they go, Oh yeah, that does sound hard. (laughs) Uh, And so that's nice. So it it becomes fair. Like it's a little easier to justify certain technical decisions or to like to talk about the complexities and like have people still be interested. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's kind of nice. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, like it's, we kind of just do it the way I think most people do it, which is like totally under, like dig in to see what they're trying to do. What's the underlying need? Okay, we understand that. Uh, we write it down. Like if, if we get a lot of requests for a certain feature, we start uh, documenting that people have asked for it. So that if we ever do ship it, we can tell them and people really mm-hmm. like that. 
but uh, it's kind of mostly like, gotcha, totally understand, like probably not on the immediate roadmap, but maybe possibly in the future, if that could come out, we'll see. We'll let you yeah. know if we ship that. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're definitely getting another benefit of having chosen your target customer so specifically to be able to describe what you just described to me, but in even more detail, I'm certain. Um, and they totally get it. It's, yeah, it's I mean, it's really fun. Like it, we can nerd out in the details and a bunch of things. Like when we ship a new <laughs> update, we'll just like tell people, by the way, like we reduce CPU usage with this thing or something. And people are like, oh, that's cool. Like, yeah. And there's also this thing happened that I, I didn't expect, which is uh, because real time communication is hard and kind of going through the internet, which is inherently kind of flaky, uh, our, and because our audience is technical, they kind of sympathize with us more than I expected. Like they go, oh yeah, I can totally see how that would be hard. I wouldn't want to have to build that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so they're a little bit more forgiving when like, oh, it doesn't work quite like the way they want it to. Yeah. Man, that's that's so great. I, so can we dig in? Like uh, you, you, you've you mentioned now a few times when you sell like we do or when you talked about like when, you're, when your co-founders were working on the code, you were out there selling it. I mean, get into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, with us, how did you, what, what exactly did that look like? Um, it actually started at MicroConf. Okay. Um, last year, I guess. Wow, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, anyway, I think it was the last MicroConf. Mm, or maybe you before, I can't remember. Anyway, so it started at MicroConf with like sort of like my immediate entrepreneur, software nerd kind of friends. Okay. And I was saying, yo, I'm, I'm starting a new thing. It, it's this. Uh, and some people would go, oh, that sounds super cool. And I'd be like, cool, yeah, like, let me know if you want to be an early customer. And some of them would say yes. And so uh, I would just start kind of making up pricing on the spot uh, and seeing what worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in the early days, I asked people to sign up for uh, a year up front. So I'd like quote them a yearly price. Okay. And the thought behind that was twofold. One was, okay, I, I want to make sure we have time to actually like use your, take your feedback and make it better. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to sign you up for a month to month thing. Like I want to, I want to have time to make something good based okay. on what you're telling us. So I'm going to ask you to kind of be with us for a while. And also I wanted to, I actually wanted there to be a pretty high bar uh, for the early people because again of that, that the importance of the early feedback. Okay. A, hi, a, the, high the, bar, a high bar fan, financially, like price point. Yeah. Like actually be like a little bit, you ha, I want to know that you were kind of a true believer. That's who we were looking for in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, a lot of people would, would, you know, react negatively to that. They'd be like, you want me to pay for a year for a thing that doesn't exist for which you don't have a ship date? And I'd be like, yeah. And so like a lot of people would say no to that, but some people would say, yes, I want this thing so badly. Like, and I would love to support you. So I'm, I'm down. Okay. And these are, and these are all still, these are people in your personal network. Um, yes. Yeah. These are all okay. people that I knew in, like had, had, would have in-person conversations with. So the okay. first handful of them. Mm -hmm. um, were like people I'd met face to face or even did it face to face pretty quickly though. Um, it moved outside that group. Um, so I talked about tuple a lot on my podcast. That's where a lot of our customers came from and come from still. Um, uh, and also we had a landing page up pretty fast. And okay. so, um, when people sign up for the landing page, we would send them a short survey. And if they seem like the right kind of company, actually, and one of the questions we would ask them is like, are you potentially interested in being a, an early customer? Mm -hmm. uh, and so when people looked right and said yes to that, I would reach out to them and talk. Uh, and that's where basically all the, the initial sales came from. What, and what did you use for that survey and how many questions did it have and what were you asking? Uh, it was a type form survey. Okay. Type form. Uh, and it had about six questions, <clears throat> something like, yeah, like a half dozen questions. And it was, you know, uh, where do you work? How many developers might potentially use Tuple there? Okay. Uh, are you potentially interested in being an early access person? Is there anything else that we should know? Okay. Kind of thing. And I love that catch-all question, by the way. That's one of my go-to like survey tricks. Okay. Because people will often want to tell you stuff. And fortunately, one of the things that people often wanted to tell us was like how excited they were, which nice. is awesome. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm Any, like, super pumped about what you're building. Anything about great. pricing at all in that survey? No. Okay. No, no pricing. Okay. How how much of a and I don't I'm trying to recall if you've shared publicly the specific numbers, but just can you just kind of give us a sense when you're saying that you're you're testing all sorts of different pricing mm -hmm. in your conversations, a range of ten percent, five hundred percent, like um, what are you messing around the, with? Yeah, I think the first Adam Wathen was the first person that signed up. He's our first customer, 
and I think it was two hundred dollars a year or two fifty a year. Okay, for just him. Um, the highest I got while I was still aggressively testing pricing was eight hundred dollars per person per year. Okay, and we actually did close one of those, uh, and we actually quoted somebody a thousand a person per year, but that did not okay. actually come in. So, okay, yeah, All so right. about a four X change. Okay, and did and that and by the so way is not today's pricing. This was like early days of just kind of seeing how how far can we take this and where can we go. Okay. And so where, where is today's pricing relative to 250 a year to 800 a year? <laughs> so we actually ended up at $25 per person per month. Okay. Okay. So $300 a year. Yes. Um, the interesting thing about that is in the beginning, <laughs> this is like kind of hilarious to me in, in retrospect, I was talking to a lot of people that were like solo operator type folks, like freelancers that wanted to pair with customers, oh, uh, like their okay. clients. Okay. And so our early pricing was kind of based on like, oh, there's one person and they're paying for the app. And then we're going to let you use it with all of your customers for free. Like you're the only person, like once you have a paid seat, you can pair with, you know, a bunch of guests basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> a thing we realized surprisingly late in the process is like, no, this is way better if you're on a team of developers <laughs> that yeah. work together already and pair a bunch. Use it regularly, like, yeah. Duh. Okay. Anyway, so basically, um, our pricing did not work for when you have, you know, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people. Um, people were more or less laughing at us at some of the price points I tried. Um, <laughs> actually, someone, I, I remember a, a particular uh, sales call and someone said, I think I remember the, I think the price was like $50 per person per month we were testing at that time. And he said, okay, if I bought this for my team, this would be the most expensive tool that we paid for by about four times. Uh, and I was like, okay, that doesn't okay. seem too high. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone. This is a good time to pause for a second and remind you that Bright and Early is brought to you by Transistor.fm. Transistor offers you professional podcast hosting and analytics. And in fact, they just made some upgrades to their analytics feature that I am already absolutely loving and just last week dhh had this to say on twitter he says we've been using transistor fm for quite a while now for the rework podcast what a great experience it's been great product great people great service i could not agree more that says it all if you are thinking about starting a podcast for your business just head over to transistor.fm and let them know that brian sent you Okay. Did you, do you have a, um, uh, do, do you have a background in sales at all? Uh, no, not really. Okay. So that, that sort of, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure what word like boldness or confidence or whatever, like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know what, I'm going to do sales calls. And some people are, some people are going to think I'm ridiculous. Some mm. people are going to laugh at me. And some of those people, I respect their opinion. Mm. What what sort of practical advice do you have for for founders who don't have a sales background who really really need to do that sort of work? There's a great quote that I think applies here, which is something like, "The quality of your life is proportional to the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have." Yeah, and I think that's, oh, that's about good. right here. Huh. Um, there's uh, me. It wasn't super uncomfortable, actually, though. Hmm. Like it would, to me, I, I kind of think of it as like a, I try to come at it with like a playful attitude. And like for pricing, a thing I like thinking about is like the, your pricing only has to like pass the giggle test, which is you have to be able to say it without laughing out loud. <laughs> yeah. And so as long yeah. as it passes that, like you should just like try it and put it out there and see what happens. Mm-hmm. But like, I, th- I think more seriously, honestly, like testing pricing is probably the high, like one of the most high leverage things you can do for a business that's almost in any phase. Like I think almost no one tests pricing too much and mm. almost no one tested enough, I think. Uh, like we should probably be doing more even now, potentially, um, even though we did a lot and settled on something that we think works for us. Yeah. Um, but even, even then, like we're still, we've still been tweaking things like uh, cost for trial versus free trial and length of trial and things like this. Yeah. Like we're, we're constantly kind of fiddling with these variables because I think they're just so high leverage for the business. Yeah. And yeah, it's a little uncomfortable and yeah, you're going to get rejected, but like 
that's part of the game. That's kind of what you're signing up for. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to do it, but your results are going to be worse if you aren't willing to have a little bit of that discomfort. Yeah. So when you, especially in the early days before you had a functional product, what, what was the, what was your goal uh, at the end of that conversation to collect the credit, a, a credit card or just to get a commitment? Like what was a... Oh no, we were going to charge the credit card. We charged them. You charged the credit card. Yep. Before before you delivered a product to the customer. Yes. How and how did you how do you describe that to them? Like you're gonna have something in X number of months, or like how how, how um, can I possibly do that? Uh we intentionally I intentionally did not commit to a release date. Okay. Because I didn't know when it would be. And so <laughs> okay. I would say, we're working hard and we're gonna try to ship this as soon as we can. Uh, but I can't promise you a particular date. Okay. Uh, I will I'm gonna charge you today. We won't start the one year clock until we actually um, actually get we're going to ship you an alpha and then you can use it during the alpha and then we'll start the one year clock at the end of it so it's kind okay. of like an annual plus a couple months kind of thing okay yeah. cool uh so i i hear you ben here's my credit card information but don't bill me don't actually bill me until i have something in my hands what do you say then um i would say well that's uh we're honestly like i know it sounds ridiculous but like the, the people we're looking for right now are true believers people that like are really really excited to get this there like into their hands Mm -hmm. and by the way one of the things we're doing with this cash is hiring consultants that are experts in these things so that we can move faster so this actually helps you get the product sooner but totally get it if that's like this is like a deal breaker for you like i'll i'll reach back out once we have something Mm -hmm. and maybe we can do it then Uh, but if you want to be in the alpha and get it first like this is what's required yeah cool okay that's that's pretty helpful were you um what what like clo- close rate or what what percentage benchmark c- can you can you say all right early stage founder you get out there and you're doing this thing you're talking to people trying to sell something before you have have it de- delivered if you're striking out like one out of or if you're if you're closing one out of 10 or one out of 20 or one out of 50 conversations like what what should what what's reasonable to say I've got something here or eh, this this is no good? Hmm. I don't know. It feels like it would depend a lot on what you're asking for and who your okay. customers are and their adventurousness and, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I would I could put out a percentage that would make sense for yeah. a lot of things or like a lot of uh, situations. But I would you can probably just develop an intuitive sense of does it seem like this is a promising yeah. avenue or not? Yeah. Like I didn't track my close rate, but People were excited. Enough people said yes. Uh, it didn't feel that hard to convince them. They were like, a lot of them were like already pretty on board. And so more than percentages, I was like, this seems, it seems like if we build this thing right, people will be excited about yeah. it. Yeah, that's definitely something that I, I hear a lot um, now, or that, that I hear a lot is early on, the just the qualitative feel of how the conversations are going where the energy is like so much more important than i'm gonna have 25 conversations and three of those need to lead to da 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 it's got it's it's just about like the the feel of energy excitement that sort of thing yep yeah yeah totally and I, i think that i think that works for a long time for a lot of things like i think brains are fairly good at taking a bunch of kind of noisy data and coming up with like a sense of you know what's the direction of this and yeah like one one area where I, I still feel like this is working fairly well for us is figuring out the next things to build like we when people like i i'm subscribed to like all our support conversations anytime someone yeah. requests something in support i see it and i just kind of let that like feed into my brain a little bit and over time sometimes i'll realize like you know a lot of people are asking for this kind of thing we should think about maybe building something like this. Yeah. But we don't like say like, okay, the last of the last hundred requests, 43 were for this feature. Yeah. And I think that's okay. I, yeah. I think like with, when you have fairly small numbers in particular, trying to like pretend that there's a magic percentage or something mm. is, is probably not really valid. That, that was going to be, uh, that's one of my other questions for you is how, how do you decide what you're going to work on at Tuple? You had, a, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but I just remembered it right now. You had one of my favorite tweets of the year Hmm. which was um, my next, my, uh, how do you put it? My newest consulting engagement. Um, you know, I, you, you pay me tens of thousands of dollars and I tell you to delete your backlog and you've lost nothing or something, yep. to, something to that effect. So yes. if you, so you don't have a backlog, 
you are not. I wish active. we didn't have a backlog. Oh, do do you actually have a backlog? Technically, sort of, yes. Hey, man, like can, I, I, uh, I have a more extreme position on this than my co-founders. <laughs> okay, so, I say, so can like, I charge you five thousand dollars and tell you to delete it? <laughs> I want to delete it. This is not the problem. <laughs> So I, I think backlogs are not valuable. I think okay. it's like, and you had Ryan Singer on and he talked yeah. about some of this and I yeah. agree with everything you said there. Okay. Uh, so we, I don't need to repeat it. People should listen to that episode anyway, because it's great. Um, Thanks. But uh, not everyone agrees with this. And for us, the backlog uh, is less like, here's a list of work we should do. And more like, here's a, a list of, well, bugs often that we know about and maybe some reproduction steps for this. And so if we ever want to go fix this particular bug because it's happening a lot, we can go look at this thing over here and a little bit of work has been done already. Okay. So it's, it's helpful. It's helpful for that documentation, but you're saying it's not, it is not how you decide what you are going to work on this week. No, definitely not. We don't, we don't like pull from the top of the backlog and work on that. How, how do, how do the three of you decide? What are you it's working been changing, on? changing actually. So we, I've been are testing out shape up now as a methodology. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago we had a pitch meeting basically or a betting meeting and, Sort of figured out some like brought some shaped pitches and figured out what to work on and so we're we're giving that a shot. Okay. We've been much more ad hoc before that, uh, and so we'll we'll see we'll see how it fits, okay. fits us. Okay. Um. Do you do you have uh do you do you guys do like feature flags or that sort of thing or is is we, are all of your customers on the same playing field? Basically, everyone's on the same playing field right now. Okay. That's something that is on our list of like important but not urgent tasks mm -hmm. that I think could, could happen in soonish. It's often, so like we have a, our app is sensitive to certain kinds of changes. Like if you're like, there's like this whole incredibly complicated interconnected pipeline of capture the screen, encode it into packets, fire it across the thing, decode it on the other side, paint it to the screen. And like, by the way, if it takes an extra 30 milliseconds, it feels worse. Yeah, right. So right. there's, and, and like, yeah, and that's just like just the screen, but there's also a webcam, there's also audio, there's audio. also keyboard events, yeah. there's mouse events. So like there's a lot of little fiddly bits in this app and it's hard, it's really hard to write an end-to-end -end test for it. So there are parts of the app that make us nervous to work on, which is not great, but it's the reality. Uh, and so I'd love to have a, like an A-B test or like a, um, a partial deploy option for some of these things because Sometimes we make a change and we're like, this seems good to us on our computers, on our network, and with the testing we're able to do. But once you push it out to a few thousand people, who knows how it's going to behave in the real world. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do the three of you have enough revenue to this point that you are, um, that you're back to, okay, we're, we're sustainable here. We all quit our jobs, been living off of savings. Are you to that point yet? Or are you? Yeah, totally. You like, okay. I, I'm, I'm basically back to my job Okay. Rep, like salary, more or less. Okay. How how long was it from? Uh, well, I was going to say first line of code, but I actually, how how long was it from quitting to? All right, we're we're there, fellas. Let's look. <laughs> I can. Actually... So, uh, I'm I'm fairly proud of this fact, but uh, looking at our uh, bare metrics graph, like our MRR twelve months ago was zero dollars. Okay. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, the point we hit. So we, we basically started realistically adding customers and building them in like February of this year. Of 2019. Uh, of 2019. And then our ramen point for us was like 15K. We decided like, okay, if we can, we can each get $5,000, we're good. We, we, yeah, yeah. Um, and we're like, we're all uh, single guys, more like Joel's married, but like no, no dependents, reasonably frugal people. So for mm -hmm. us, 15K was, was sustainable. Okay. Uh, and so we, yeah, February. So we basically in June of 19, we hit 15K. Okay, nice. And so, and that's with a pretty, that's with a pretty decent, like, uh, price point per, per seat, per customer. Like, uh, maybe. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Congratulations. I mean, that's, thank you. It's pretty yeah, spectacular. It's grown faster than I, than I thought it would, which is mm. very gratifying. Are you, are y'all considering, um, making any hires or, we like, talk where, about where it kind of at. Yeah, where are you at with the stage of the company now that you've seen this sort of, you've got traction, you can mm -hmm. do it full time. Where are you at? Um, we talk about it a lot. Um, the biggest missing skill set we have, I would say, is design. So it's tempting to hire a design. And I, I love good design. Like mm -hmm. I love beautiful products and investing in like really good user experience. Yeah. Uh, and so 
I'm tempted to hire a designer more than anything else. Uh, but sort of close to that would also just be like another developer to let us do yeah. more stuff there. So we talk a lot about uh, the potential of like maybe a part-time designer, maybe a part-time contract developer that, that, that has like a set number of hours, hours per week. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far we have not committed to any of that. We've hired consultants for like individual projects, but we have like no like kind of recurring external people. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if we hired somebody next year. Okay. Uh, we're growing pretty fast and adding a lot of customers. So like support could actually be a, a thing. That's, that that's what I was going to, going to ask about that. I would, I was surprised to hear you say design because the tool is, is designed yes. <laughs> specifically yeah. to just be out of the way and remain out of the way. Yes. So, yeah, I think uh, so like design part of design is like, how does it look? But a lot of design is how does it work? Yeah. So like, yes, there's not that much, like there's, there's no undismissable UI Chrome that we have to make look nice, but there is an app up in your menu bar. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of like, there's a lot of subtlety in like how it should work. Like giving someone remote control of your machine. How does that work? What does the handoff look like? How do you know when someone else is going to use your mouse so you don't yeah. collide? Yep. Like how should the webcam work? If I turn on my webcam, should it turn on yours? There's just like a, there's just a ton of little UX details that you yeah. have to sweat to do it really well, I think. Nice. Um, final question I want to ask, and then we can, uh, we can uh, wrap it up, was going to be about uh, support, actually, and how, mm -hmm. the, how involved the three of you remain on, or obviously you're, you're all doing support, or, or you're all, you, you remain uh, involved in support. How, mm -hmm. how do you share it, or what's your, what's your process like? Um, company. Actually, so Joel uh, is the front, like the front line. He handles okay. almost all of it. Mm -hmm. So occasionally, like so, anything that comes in is like, hey, I have a, a a problem or a request or like a, yeah, like we have sort of an in-app feedback mechanism, and Joel gets all of that. Um, I handle other things like we send an email to people, like, hey, like how can the app be better, and like that kind of is like my product manager kind of responsibility. So mm -hmm. I respond to those. Um, but we, so we're between Joel and I, we mostly cover basically all of the incoming email more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, uh, how can listeners find and follow you online, Ben? Um, podcast is probably the, the best choice. You're obviously a listener of podcasts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, art of product <laughs> is my podcast. I host it Great with Derek Reimer. Yep. Um, that's good. If you like hot takes, I'm r 0 k on Twitter uh, and you know, tuple.app for business stuff. If you're curious. All right. T U P L E dot app hey what's the what's the genesis of the r 0 k by the way <laughs> yeah so uh when i was like 12 i was really into chess and that is basically when i started like making internet accounts and handles <laughs> things yep <laughs> uh and uh rook was like my favorite chess piece and r zero r o o k was taken most of the time and so i was like well if i make it look ha -ha. all cool and replace the o's <laughs> with zeros then yeah. i can get my name and that just kind of stuck. And, yeah, and so I, I basically stopped that, but there's a couple things that I've been on for like a decade now or something that, that still have that, that old handle and Twitter is one of them. Right on. My guest today has been Ben Orenstein. Ben, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experience with us. My pleasure. Hope it was helpful. Hey everyone, let's do some closing thoughts here. It's good to be back. After a couple of weeks off, I was actually down in the Grand Canyon uh, for that first week off doing some backpacking with some buddies. And so, yeah, one week down in the Grand Canyon with without a, uh, a cell tower or a Wi-Fi router in sight. It was <laughs> it was really nice. It was very, very refreshing. And so this interview with Ben was at at. 9 a.m. Monday, uh, like <laughs> after I had gotten back, uh, you know, like late, late, late Saturday night and uh, recovered a little bit on Sunday and then first thing. So if I sounded a little bit, uh, a little bit off my game or uh, uh, tired, then, uh, then that was, that was why, but it's it good to, it is, it's good to be back. And so let's, uh, let's see what all, what all we got there. Um, the first thing was just, I, I like their their approach around uh, tuple of uh, when Ben said little details matter and 
like Zoom has remote control. Some other things have that sort of, you know, functionality. Um, but that's not those companies' focus. The little details matter to uh, to Ben's target audience, uh, picky developers uh, with high standards um, and, you know, with extremely, like, you know, high needs in terms of, of what Tuple offers uh, with, in terms of latency and um, and speed and the, the sense that you are when you're pair programming remotely with Tuple that it has the feeling of sitting side by side at the same desk. And so every little detail there uh, matters and the more attention they pay to those details then the greater advantage they're going to have over those more generic conferencing tools that do already exist but will will just not be able to compete with tuple on those specific things that they do well in the same way that that tuple is not going to be able to compete with zoom on getting six seven or a dozen people into any particular any particular conference that's just not what they want to do and i i Liked when Ben mentioned, you know, the way that he said, we were de-risking very early. Uh, and they were de-risking in the form of selling. So while his two partners are writing code, uh, Ben's out there describing it to see if people will uh, will pay for it. And so I, I think I, I like that. I do. I like that approach quite a bit, you know, because I was asking, and I genuinely didn't know the answer, but was asking to see if, you know, what sort of, what did they do on the, the solution validation front. Um, it seems like they, they had, they intrinsically knew that the, the problem validation was there. Um, people loved screen hero when it was around, uh, and then it, then it disappeared. There's this gap in the market that they were personally experiencing. And so they, they believe strongly enough that, that the problem validation was there, but in terms of solution validation, it wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, asking and, a whole lot of interviewing to, to, to get it, to nail it, to nail it, to nail it. It was them saying, remember how great Screen Hero was? <laughs> um, well, let's build something that does, you know, some, some similar, offers similar functionality, you know, brings that back to people who love it. If we do, will you pay for it? And so they were, they were getting, obviously, they were getting some responses uh, and things that they needed. I liked that bit about uh, kind of context setting around a vision for a better way of working. Um, when we were talking about the the marketing copy and the positioning of their landing page, uh, you if you have it, uh, seriously go to tuple dot app, tuple dot app. Um, I just the their the the marketing copy and just the vibe it just completely resonates with me. It's one of those things that it feels like it should be very easy to do. But, uh, but, but it's hard. Um, it's, I think, I think it's hard. It's almost harder to sound, uh, yeah, to sound conversational and make a strong business case, uh, without getting all businessy or, or whatever. So anyway, um, this was, I just enjoyed, I, I, I like the way that they position their product. Uh, and I like when, you know, his, 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 kind of comments around if you're worried about an objection talk about it if there's an elephant in the room then address it and that just makes so much that makes so much sense if you if you've got a good customer if you're if you've got an offering and you know that there are a couple of other things out there in the marketplace that um that you're, you're going to be bumping up against or directly competing against if you've got a good lead if you've got a good cust potential customer on the other side of your conversation you know, you better hope that they're at least aware of those other offerings, those other companies. If they aren't, then they're probably not your customer. And so, yeah, you might as well bring it up. Might as well mention, you know, that, yes, you can do these things in Zoom, but the lag isn't there or, you know, et cetera, and, and fill in the blank, whatever your, whatever your offering uh, might be. Um, mention them by name and say specifically why that status quo is not good enough. Um, and why, yeah, why, if, if they're a good customer for you, then they're probably frustrated, uh, with the status quo, bring up those things that are frustrating and discover if, if those frustrations are, are big and bad enough in order for them to switch. And if, look, if they're, if they're not frustrated with the status quo, then you may not have a product on your hands. Um, 
you know, so there's <laughs> also <laughs> there are a couple of benefits to uh, to just being direct about about that. Uh, let's see what else. It was it, it is interesting that they weren't necessarily. I feel like I'm recalling this correctly that they weren't necessarily targeting a a company demographic, like in terms of company size, um, as much as they were targeting like a point of view. Uh, picky developers who missed screen who missed screen hero um, picky developers for whom you know remote control across zoom is not enough um, and you know as I, I guess I was kind of I was expecting a little bit more to hear like we yeah we knew that this sort of business is our is our target and it seems like anyway at least in the very very early days it was Ben talking with his community um who shared his level of uh, his 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 degree of expectations for what makes for an acceptable remote pair programming experience, and and that sort of spe- specificity and that that type of target um, going after somebody who shares your point of view as opposed to somebody who works in a company that you might want to sell to that that specificity that makes it easy for Tuple to speak to their customers because they are them <laughs> and uh, that's that's a great that's a great strength uh, it's a great strength that they've got there and uh, yeah that was it was, a, it was around that point in the conversation when we were was talking a little bit about um, you know some of the requests that they're beginning to get um, and the the tension that, that that's bringing up um, you know like wanting to go up to, to three people on it or uh, you know four or five or whatever because people are wanting to do their stand-ups with it so a, a use case um, that as you mentioned is kind of flattering um, that they would they would want to use it but but it doesn't it doesn't match with their what they're going after if, if you enjoyed that bit of it um, episode 111 of Ben's podcast with Derek Reimer art of product episode 111 like around the I want to say like the six to seven ish minute mark um, Ben shares a little bit more about how, about talking to people, um, uh, how, how they're doing some product, you know, feature management and what they're deciding to add to the product, um, as people are beginning to use it for ways they hadn't quite imagined and the tension that that creates on the product side of things. And so if, if that piece of the conversation stuck out to you and you want to hear Ben talk about that more, um, yeah, check out episode 111 of, of Art, Art of Product. Now the the major the yeah I can say this for myself anyway the major takeaway from this episode this conversation with Ben was about selling before they even had a product um I just I think it's just a very very good case study in how exactly to do this and so um you know getting started off with pricing for pricing by the pricing annually for a year um, number one, he said they wanted to be sure we, we want to be sure that we have time to respond to your feedback. And so I'm going to ask you to be with us for a while. So I'm thinking about this personally right now. I'm like starting to, you know, got a side project going that I am ready to, to start selling. And so if you heard me definitely like <laughs> perk up at this point in the, in the interview and say, okay, how exactly am I going to, this is why, um, cause I'm getting ready to do this. And I, and I like this, um, positioning it as selling an annual plan. So we want you to have, we want to be sure that you're with us for a while and we want it, we want there to be a bit of a high bar so that we find the true believers. Um, I think that's really important because, uh, you know, as you start to get, as you get feedback, if customers are making requests and you haven't been extremely focused on that initial set of customers, then you might be responding to the wrong, wrong requests. So, um, and then I, you know, I liked uh, the thing of, Hey, you, you want me to pay a year for a thing that doesn't exist and doesn't have a ship date? Yes. Um, okay. Well, well, why exactly? And, and I like this, like this answer around that of, well, look, we're not, we're not starting the clock yet. Okay. We're not starting the clock on your plan. Um, and we're, we'll give you the alpha, but yo, like be prepared to be patient. Um, and, and we're going to get the, you know, get a functional beta over to you as quickly as we can. And at that point, then we'll start the clock on your year. Um, but we're going to, are do, do you believe in this? Are you with us? If so, yeah, we're going to charge your credit card so that we can start hiring contractors to and and pay for ourselves a bit to start making making progress on this. 
Uh, just loved that, loved that bit of the, love that bit of the conversation. Also, he was talking about that, uh, you know, when, when he, you, if you are closed, um, if uh, presumably after you've got kind of a couple of cohorts of close friends and family using it, and then you begin to get some traffic and some buzz and have a closed beta to send like what is effectively, I mean, he's talking about like a lead scoring survey, like where do you work? For, for Tuple anyway, the important questions are, where do you work? How many developers will be using this? Are you interested in early access and anything else we should know? Um, yeah, it's just a, a very, very short uh, lead scoring survey uh, in that way. Um, it's, it's a really good, really good thing to note. Um, let's see, around, uh, around the topic of pricing, it was interesting that you know he's tinkering around with with price points from 250 up to 800 per uh, per user per year and then they've ended up coming way on down or relatively way on down to 300 um now any any listeners who are also in like the microconf patrick mckenzie circle would feel like hey well, hang on a second now if you're able to quote unquote charge more and get up to 600 700 800 then why in the world are you down here at three um and you know he just kind of fleshed out that as the as they brought on more customers and as their the business matured and they realized that their original model just didn't work for what is going to end up being their best customers that is companies with lots of seats and so um, that that I found to be really fascinating. I think that adds a very important nuance to the just, you know, blanket statement repeating of always just like charge more, charge more, charge more. That is usually the right advice. Um, it is not, you know, it's, it's not uh, flawless in every single situation. And, and I think that that piece of the conversation was one other example of where that nuance kind of comes in and you have to, you have to know. Um, I do, I, I, I wonder, I, I'm mad at myself for not asking if they did any sort of like price sensitivity, um, uh, surveys. I'll, I'll add some links in the show notes. Uh, price intelligently has a good blog article about, um, price sensitivity. There's this Van Westendorp's price sensitivity meter uh, that does not exactly roll off of the tongue um, that Justin Jackson over at Transistor has mentioned himself. He and John have talked about it on the Builder SaaS podcast. Um, and Justin has has talked to Ben and uh, and Jordan Gall, um, Gall or Gal, um, I think it's Gall, about uh, the, about price sensitivity and so i'll link i'll link to those things as well really great really great conversations um i guess the final thing is like he was talking about uh you know during during the the private you know uh, during that private period and um selling before they yeah selling before they had a full product um there's like not committing to a release date but uh but just saying that you know we're 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 charging you today. You can use the alpha. We're not going to start the clock. Um, and in those early days when you're walking, when you're working with small numbers, feel and energy is enough. And so you could hear me asking like, okay, well, what, like, what was your close rate? Like what percentage, what's a good benchmark if I start doing this, um, that, that I should be, I should be shooting for. That's me looking for some degree of certainty and assurance uh, when, but you know, when you're early and you're working with small numbers, that sort of, uh, that, that quest is probably futile. Um, and what Ben was saying was, well, yeah, I mean, like, is there energy? Is there growth? Are you making some progress? That's enough. So if you're, if you're a regular listener, um, it's episode 25 now, um, you've probably noticed me doing this pretty regularly, which is to try to ask for percentages, um, for, for, you know, a number of different things that, that entrepreneurs are talking about. That's me trying to establish, uh, you know, a, a, a range, um, to know like, Hey, here's, here's what I'm getting. Is that, is that in the range? Um, and what I'm, what's interesting is how often the entrepreneur says, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, we could just, we could just sort of tell. Um, it's happened a number of times now, and it just, it just reminds me that entrepreneurship is 
so much in art and having that sort of ha- having that sense of feel of do we have something here is there is there movement is there energy is there, are we in a growth are we in a growth area um, can we or are we getting some traction here getting a feel for that qualitatively early days is so much more important and leaning on that and relying on that is way more important than expecting quantitative data when you're working with small numbers to assure you. And so this was just another good reminder for me um, that, yeah, tr- trust your trust your sense, uh, trust your feel, um, not always, not forever, and not in everything, um, but certainly, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of discovery and getting a sense for who your customers are, uh, what they want, and how you can best deliver it to them. I would love to hear what you think about uh, about that particular thought as well as everything else Ben and I uh, chatted with. You can find me on Twitter. I am B Ray. That is B R H E A. Thanks so much as always for listening, and I will talk to you later.